Could I now invite uh, Warren Jo Leo and Rowena Triev to join me up here. We'll take our seats. There was to have been a third uh, person here, Jeanette Kirk. Uh, Jeanette is a nurse and she told a very interesting story um, at Ormiston House the other day about um, she's now, she eventually uh, qualified as a nurse, but initially she was told um, when she was 16 or 17 at school by um, a, a careers advisor to forget about nursing, they don't take black people. But her parents um, were proud and um, insisted she continue with her dream. And she said the proudest moment of her life was uh, being introduced to Fred Hollows, Professor Fred Hollows, when she was in charge of the trachoma and eye health program for the whole of South East Queensland. There are many South Sea Islanders who have made a terrific contribution. Can you still hear me? Good. Um, in, in this uh, session here, we've called it uh, a history not forgotten. And uh, this session is a time for the telling by Australian South Sea Islanders of their history in Queensland through both personal and family experiences and exploring how Queensland, the landscape, hides many unspoken truths about our past. So I'll be asking uh, Warren and Rowena to uh, talk for a little bit, um, but then we'll ask a few questions and throw it open to questions from the floor. So Warren, Joe, Leah, if I could start with you. Warren is a prominent elder from the Rockhampton area and in many different roles has been working for years to get recognition for average Australian South Sea Islanders along with his wife, Monica, who is also with us today. Warren, Joe, received his OAM medal for his contribution to the Indigenous Australia South Sea Islander communities and the whole of the community. He's well known in this area, up and down and along the coast of Queensland. So Warren, if I could start with you, could you just tell us a little bit about your story, what you remember about being told about your ancestors coming here? Well, actually, as a kid, we weren't told anything about it, just that we were Australian South Island, like by my father. When I first started school, he said, when you go to school today, they'll ask you, what are you? He says, and you tell them you're an Australian South Island. And I didn't know what that was. But anyway, the teacher did ask me. I don't know what, what I was. I said, I'm Australian South Sea Islander. It was around about 1939 when I started school. And, uh, well, I went through life, actually, as a young fellow. Because after finishing school, I finished in fourth grade, halfway through fourth grade. This was up in air when I started school in Yarsfield School, because that's where I was born in air. And um, we come back here to Rocky in 1943, because Dad's mother, my grandmother, she passed away in 43, so he come back for the funeral. And I don't think he had enough money to come back up to air, <laughs> so he stayed here to get a job at Lace Creek. And we come up after. He wasn't going to come back up there, I think. So we come back here to uh, Rocky. And um, he stayed with me, his sister, in uh, Elphinstone Street. And then days in Elphinstone Street, from Elphinstone Street to Ford Street, where all the South Sea Islanders lived down there in Creek Street and Ford Street. That was just between there, that was just Brigalow Scrub. And uh, me and my eldest brother, we used to walk through the scrub. There was a, pa a 
bad through the scrub and we used to walk through the scrub every weekend to go down and play cricket down with all the boys down Fourth Street. But then from there we went over to the boarding house near the railway station. And the police seen us walking from the baker shop one day and follows us down. And when we seen the police coming in the car, we raced down the laneway. And they come down the laneway in the car. And they seen where we went into was back of the boarding house. And they come in. And they asked me mother, the mother who I called Auntie, all my life. And uh, that's what we wasn't going to school. We lived just across from school, from the Amsterdam school. And I told my husband, she said, when he comes home. Yeah. So when he came home from work, I told him that when we got caught with the police because we wasn't going to school. And I packed up and went down Joskily. And that's where his mother and father lived. They were from Vanuatu. Uh, Granddad Leo was from Pentecost Island. And Granny Leo was from Oba Island, now called Omboy. And the thing was, they were, it was strange because they lived in separate huts. Because one being from Oba and one being from Pentecost Island. And it just didn't add up. But then if you've ever been over to uh, in the islands over in any, any one of the islands, you didn't marry out of your own group. So Pentecost Island, where my grandfather lived, well, he couldn't marry anybody else but Pentecost. from his old watch call. No, from his... <laughs> Um, group in, mm. on, on, uh, on the island. And uh, even anywhere else on the same island, you couldn't marry them. You, you within, had to marry them, otherwise you'd get killed. Within his own but, language group, huh? Yeah. Mm. And uh, I, well, I'd done away with you, see? So when he married a woman from Ober Island, well, that was, uh, it was non. So when they went, end up at Josh Kalee because while they went to Josh Kalee there was supposed to be a sugar cane start up for the uh, industry there for the Australian South Sea Islanders and it never eventuated because it's all sand Josh Kalee it's all sand actually. and so they started over, over in Yapoon the other side of Yapoon that's where the sugar cane started, but it only lasted there for about 15 or 16 years or something like that. And um, they pulled up, what you call them there, from the, uh, the big sugar mill that they had there and they sent it to Mackay. And uh, that's where it finished up in Mackay. And that's, well, you know, where really the sugar took off from there and right up north. Did you ever hear any stories about how they were recruited, how they were yeah, brought? It was through Robert Towns, uh, who they named town, uh, Townsville after Robert Towns. He was a bloke that got all the boats. He got all the boats to go over to pick up uh, recruits from over in around about, around about 80 islands from over there, and also the Solomon Islands, where my mother's father came from. And that's how they started recruiting. And it was pretty, what you call them, horrific, I think, on what they'd done. Because in the beginning, it was all good because they show them things, what they can bring home when they finished their three years' term. But it never ventured, it never happened that way, never was going that way. When they come out, the first couple of shiploads that 
came back, went back to Vanuatu, but after that, the boats took them anywhere. So from 1863 to 1904, actually, it was straight through, something like 202,000 people were brought out from Vanuatu and the Solomon Islands. At, in around about 1920, 1922, my grandfather on one, my mother's side, who I never ever knew until I was about 27 year old, because she died when I was two year old. Uh, her father, my grandfather, his name was Jack Morata, Jack Malata, and Malata's place on Solomon Island. I don't know what the Jack Morata, Morata must have been his, his right name, but that's, he went under two names, Jack Morata, Jack Malata. And he got flogged that much up in the Ingham district, around that district. He got flogged, he got flogged insane. And he had three daughters. Um, Auntie Lottie, Lottie Oliver, she married James E. Oliver, Uncle James. Uh, my mum, her name was Nancy. And uh, Auntie Myrtle Backo, she married a Backo. Sam Backer, the footballer, well, uh, George Backer was his uncle. And that's the other, uh, Annie Myrtle, and she's still alive. She's 96, I think, today, 96 or 97 today. But um, the thing was that when he, Dad lost his first wife, my mum, he married this, uh, this other girl looked after us. Well, we uh, called her auntie, and he ended up marrying her. And then I find out that she was a half-sister to me, <laughs> mum. So I said, well, what's going on? I called her auntie, nearly all of a 27-year-old. I was still calling her auntie, and me and Monica married, and, we had our first child, Carmen. And when she started talking, I said to Mom, I said, oh, I've got to go over and start calling Auntie Nan. So my children will call her Nan, see? And when I went over and I called her Nan for the first time in my life, I was 27, she got the shock of her life. And when I got back home, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm losing it a bit here now. Oh. oh, goodness, sorry about that, people. That's certainly all right. But, uh, and she followed me back home. She's in Rockhampton, and followed me back from her place, and she only just lived down the road, Dad, and, and she bought this photo. She says, this is your mum. I said, what? She says, this is your mother, Nancy. It's my sister. I said, So, you know, it's just a sort of a shock mm. to you, what you go see, you know, it all, uh, didn't go as much as what the old people did. And so that's what's going on in my life, but my grandmother and grandfather not living together in the one grass hut. I couldn't work that out because they were from different islands. Yeah. And they were frightened, I think, that somebody come over from the island and found them and might have killed them or what, I don't know. You know, but there's some strange things on uh, what our island people done up in the islands, you know. 
not a very, especially on Pentecost Island anyway. And uh, that's how I, I can, when I went back, when we went over the, for the first time, when we found out where we actually come from, although we were born and bred in Australia, our people came from the Vanuatu, New Hebrides in them days. And uh, so we went over to find out what island we were. So the grandfather and grandmother never talk about that. Never talk about where they came from. And they didn't go back there. And I think for the simple reason, because they were from different island, they probably got killed by their own people. When did you go back? I went back in 1994, 94. What was that like? Hey? How did you feel? Well, when I walked down the street in Port Vila, goodness me, and run across our cousins, you can see straight away. <laughs> oh, it was just unreal it was. Yeah, mm. it was unreal, you know. And of course, as soon as they found out who you was, well then, then bang, come on, and we went out to the village in Port Vila, and oh man, met them all, eh? And then they told us then what village over in Pentecost we come from and that. So we caught a plane and went over there, that was in 94. 95 we went back, 96 we went back, and we ended up building a house up there in uh, Pentecost. It's finished about 10 years ago and I haven't seen it. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen it. So anyway, yeah. it, uh, some of the uh, things that I was going to come here and talk about, and I sent it on her. Joanne sent it, my daughter sent it out down to us. So going to put it up on the screen. Right. Yeah. But, um, Is this... Oh, yeah, that's, that's yeah. me there, and that's me cousin this end, and that's cousin on that other end. They're two brothers, uh, Aru's. Where, where and was I, that taken? Where was that photo? That was 94. Ah. 94 and 95, we went over, 96, we went over, all the way going up to Pentecost Island. And they lived in the grass hut, say. And they still do live in the grass hut, but I built a house, there's a, a big fellow on this end here. He, he says, yo, I'll look after your house for us. No, you look after, you get inside that house. That's what he used to do. <laughs> 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 uh, he got the shock of his life. Hey, hey, I said, you live in the house. I, I said, I might not come back. I go back home, I might die. You get in the house, hey. That's terrific, Warren. Uh, Rowena, could I bring you into the conversation? Rowena is a prominent yeah. Australian South Sea Island elder from the Mackay region and has been very active, contributed to raising awareness of Australian South Sea Islander history. Rowena's grandmother was taken onto a boat as a young girl and brought to Australian shores near Mackay and remained there for many years. Rowena, could you tell us a little bit about that? I'd be honoured to... I'd be honoured to talk about my grandmother. Um, my grandmother's journey started in 1875 when she, her and a friend of hers was walking along the beach on Omboy Island uh, at Wallariki was the name of the beach and they were gathering seashells to make necklaces. After some time they looked up and they saw a schooner anchored in the bay and they could see two men in a rowboat rowing towards the shore. What happened after that was something that was to change the lives of those two girls forever. The men grabbed the girls, put them in the boat and took them out to the schooner. They were then placed in the hold of the boat. Uh, the name of the boat was Barabel. It was one of those labour ships that were calling at the different islands um, throughout the Pacific, uh, collecting uh, people to work in the emerging sugar uh, plantations in Australia, mainly Queensland, and 
this boat was headed for Mackay. The girls were very traumatised because they did not know where they were going or what would happen to them. When they, um, uh, uh, after they were out at sea for some time, they let them out of the uh, hold of the boat because they were in there with other islanders that were being collected from different islands and uh, th they were allowed to uh, come up on deck. The girls were assigned uh, jobs to do. Uh, they had to scrub the deck each morning and day. Some of the islanders were frightened and they were determined to get away and they wanted to swim back home. But those that jumped overboard were, the, were either shot or, or taken by sharks. <coughs> the journey took three months after the, they collected from the different islands and they arrived in Mackay uh, where they were, um, there's a Leichhardt tree at Mackay which is famous for, uh, is a heritage piece as a, known as where the South Sea Islanders first came to Mackay. They were, they were taken off the boats and then they were given um, a, a set of, uh, two sets of clothes, a blanket, and uh, they were assigned to the different sugar plantations. Now, Katie and her friend Lucy were um, assigned to Ashburton Station. Now, Ashburton was about <coughs> 19 miles in distance from uh, Mackay, so what they had to do was walk that, that distance, and uh, then they were put to work. Their job was to clear, because cane was being grown on hillsides mostly, they had to clear timber and, and, and clear the land of grass and everything. Now, it was really hard work. It was from daylight till dark. But the girls and, and the men, there was lots of men, and hardly any, um, there wasn't very many girls taken on, on the trip, but there was a lot of men that needed to do the work. But these two girls had to work too, as well as the men, because they weren't deemed good enough to work in the houses of the plant plantation owners. K Katie was at, the, at Ashburton for 25 years and then she had the opportunity, uh, one of the, um, there was a, a, a rule that after a few years the islanders were given a free a return passage home to the islands that they came from. So by that time, Katie had a daughter. So she decided to take her three-year-old daughter back to the islands and see her family. She stayed over there and helped the her relatives um, uh, clear the land uh, there and plant their crops with her newfound skills. But Katie had gone, got so used to living in Australia that she, want, she came back after, she used her, uh, her passage to come back after nine months. Then she started at another station, uh, Alexandra Station, and, and there she met and married a Willie Marler, and they had two children. One, one of them was my mother. Uh, and um, so she, she, after a while, Willie, oh, after a couple of years, Willie Marler decided to return to Fiji and, um, and work for the CSR over there. So Katie was left on her own with the children, even though she had, uh, they both had exemption papers, 
so that it allowed them to stay in Australia. Okay. After a while, Katie worked on, a, found another job on a horse and um, cattle station. On, on that was a very, uh, the woman on that property were, was very kind and uh, she was a Christian lady and she, sh she took Katie in and showed her how to cook and uh, clean and bake bread and Ka Katie spent several years working for this woman. The woman also had a big influence on Katie's life and because she was a very kind Christian woman. And uh, Katie was able to have her children there with her. I still have at home um, a letter written by the lady to my mother uh, to, uh, to, uh, reminiscing of the days gone by when she said that my mother used to c carry a mat around from their drawing room and while this lady was sewing, she'd come up to him and, and say, say, sing, lady, sing, missus, sing, sing, she wanted to go to sleep. And uh, so I've got that in a book of my treasures at home, which, which I value greatly. Katie had a hard life. When, she, when her children went to school, then she worked in the Homebush Sunnyside area outside of Mackay. And, then, and uh, she decided that she would, uh, 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 you know, look, uh, look after her children and work for the uh, um, plantation and the mill people's houses, which she did. And every Saturday, uh, she had joined the Seven Day Adventist Church, uh, and every Saturday she'd walk uh, 38 miles uh, to go to church at Farley outside of Mackay and return. And she'd be joined by, Lucy would go with her, and she'd be joined by all other islanders along the way, and they'd go to this church. Now, this went on for years. Religion played a very important part in the lives of the islanders. It helped them uh, to be able to cope with all the difficulties and things that they found um, that sometimes would get the better of them. And they, they had this, uh, the um, Anglican and Presbyterian churches introduced them to Christianity and and they, so they, today, throughout the church, all churches in Australia, you can see their representatives uh, being represented in those, those churches. When Katie was working on the plantation at Ashburton, uh, they used to have um, them out working and they'd be... Uh, supervised by men, uh, overseers, sitting on horses with whips. And it, sometimes when Katie, when they didn't think Katie was working fast enough, they'd box her ears for it. So after this happening several times, Katie must have thought, uh, had been a bit fed up, so she ran away. Uh, and hid in the Mackay Cemetery. When she was found, she, they, they punished her and took her back to the plantation. They, um, when they punished her, after they'd punished her, they put shackles around her legs, around her ankles, and she had to walk the 19 miles back to this plantation. How old would she have been then? She would have been about uh, 
47, I think. Yeah. Oh, no, um, it, she was younger because that was before before she went over to Vanuatu in the, when she had that before she her daughter. Back. No, she must have been about in the 30s then. And, and so they... And you know that brave little woman uh, carried those marks of those shackles around her tiny ankles until the day she died in 1944. She, she co continued working and then in, when she was 67, she couldn't get the pension because they weren't recognised by government, so they had no pension. So what did she do? She decided to uh, lease some land from a farmer, uh, uh, five acres it was, and it was five. He only let the acreage go because it had uh, scrub and and uh, grass and everything on it, and it was rocky. So she took it, and so she la she had to clean this land and to grow her cane. She uh, she cleared the land herself with a mattock and hoe, and then she went and uh, and sh she'd walk three miles to her neighbours and get some cane, which she which she cut into small pieces and and took to uh, back home in a sack bag, carried it on her back, uh, and then she'd plant her cane. Each year, uh, as it came round after crushing, she'd crush the cane, and she'd cut the cane for crushing, and and she'd carry it to to the siding. Uh, drag it to the siding, get a end of a farmer's um, horse and take it to the siding and it'd go to the mill. Racecourse Mill has in its records, old records, that um, Katie had grew Bedilla cane, if anyone knows anything about cane, she drew, uh, grew Bedilla cane and it, in amongst that was a record crop she grew, and inside that, with that crop, was a stool of cane that had 32 stalks of cane in it. And uh, that's not a bad effort for a little old <laughs> island woman. What an extraordinary story. Yeah. Look, we're starting to run out of time, mm. but I would uh, like to invite anyone in the audience to pose any questions to either of these. Two remarkable people. <coughs> Can I see a hand up anyway? Yes. There's a, there's a microphone coming down. With the passing of the, uh, well, uh, of the con Constitution of Australia in, after 1901, I think it was... Well, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, the, the date about 1903, there was repatriation of uh, South Sea Islanders back to Vanuatu and other areas. We, uh, we haven't had any comments. Uh, this must have been a very traumatic experience with some of the uh, people. Uh, have any of you had experience of relations that were repatriated and how do they feel after being in Australia for a number of years? How do they feel going back to their island community? The, the people who arrived before 1880s something were allowed to, to stay, um, but many thousands were actually repatriated. Did, do you have any knowledge, either of you, of any relatives who...? And no, I, I haven't, but what, what I've he heard from my, my parents who, who were alive then, they said that many of the islanders were uh, taken back to the uh, islands, were re 
repatriated, as you say, but many of them ran away and hid in the mountains, and they or they were uh, sheltered by sympathetic farmers, and a lot of them. Um, but when they were taken back, the unscrupulous captains of the boats didn't take them to the islands that they had come from. They just dropped them off or wherever they saw fit that they, and they didn't take them back to their proper islands. So then you get, uh, you sometimes see Pacific Islanders, you know, in, in places where you wouldn't expect to see them, you know. Joe, did you know of anyone? Hmm? Your, any of your ancestors, apart from the ones who remained, who had to go back that you know of? Uh, uh, yeah. They were all gone. Yeah. But uh, uh, yeah, that's a long time, eh? It's yeah. Really out of here. Is there another question? Yes, certainly. Sorry, where are we? <laughs> when I visited, when I visited uh, Solomon's, I came across a member of parliament who was born in Bundaberg. Um, I didn't have a big time for story there, but um, my understanding that the, um, some of the ones that were sent back, were born here, had no idea of custom culture and whatever, and they um, caused a bit of conflict over there because they didn't uh, understand that what the life they lived over there, they took over, over here, they took over there. And that's when maybe the word Kanaka was derogatory in that, in that fashion. Um, um, my a story was told by Pastor Festus Farmire in uh, Solomon's was that, that that was a story, that it was when the people who didn't know what they were doing was wrong. And that's how the uh, word might have been derogatory to, in that fashion. Um, my my f grandfather was dropped off at the wrong place the chief allowed him and his mate to stay in the cave until another ship came. But my father was allowed, to, my grandfather was allowed to stay here because he had a family of seven. His children had gone to school here and even my dad had to pass the immigration test and yet he was here schooling. But we um, remained in, in Nambu. Thank you. Thank you very much. We've run out of time, I'm afraid. We're going to have to move on to... You can keep going if you Sorry. want. Sorry. We've got a little bit more time. Oh, sure. Sorry, there was someone wanting to make a comment. Did I see? The ones that repatriated and who were able to became leaders in the, the in Vanuatu, Solomon's, wherever they were. Is there anyone else who would like to ask a question or make a comment? Right. Thank you both very much. That's been excellent. <laughs>